All right. Well, also on Sunday mornings, we're in the book of Romans. We're going through this book chapter by chapter and verse by verse. And today we find ourselves in verse 6. And Lord willing, we'll make it through to verse 9 of Romans chapter 9. So uh, what we'll do, if you're visiting with us here today, what we usually do for the reading of God's Word is I have you stand, you follow along, I read, uh, and you follow along in the text. Now, if you're unable to stand, that's all right. Uh, You can still follow along, but let's go ahead and stand at this time. Romans chapter 9, beginning in verse 6, the Apostle Paul, by the Holy Spirit, is writing and says... It is not as though God's word had failed, for not all who are descended from Israel are Israel, nor because they are his descendants are they all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. In other words, it is not the natural children who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. For this was how the promise was stated. At the appointed time, I will return, and Sarah will have a son. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word, and thank you for this passage that we have set before us today. Lord, we're not going to even begin to admit that we don't need the Holy Spirit now to minister this to us. It's pretty packed full. It's pretty meaty. It's kind of intense. So Lord, will you now, by the Holy Spirit, minister this to us, teach us, and speak to us so that our time, our remaining time together in your word will not have been a waste of time. Lord, thank you in advance for what you're going to do. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. Thank you. Today's teaching is part two of a new series we began last week titled, The Mercy of God Almighty. Mercy different than grace. We addressed that and made the distinction in that. Uh, In the first five verses, we were able to answer two very big questions, the first of which was, how is it that I, like Paul, can have a heart for the lost? The second question we were able to answer from the first five verses was, how can I actually, truly, sincerely, genuinely love someone who hates my guts? And the answer was in verses one through five. Well, aren't you going to give us the answers? No. Well, I wasn't here last week. Okay, get the CD. Now, in verses 6 through 9, we don't have time. I, don't, I mean that lovingly. We just don't have time to re-preach last week's sermon. Uh, in verses 6 through 9 now, we, we've got a third question. It's another big question. And it's how I can know or how can I know if someone I know is truly a Christian? They say they're a Christian. Not all who say they are Christians are Christians. See, and Paul is saying to them then, not all who say they are Israel are Israel. Not all who say they are Jews are Jews. And so too for us now, he would say, not all who say they are Christians are Christians. Now, we begin in verses 6 and 7 where Paul says that God's word hasn't failed. Not all Israel's descendants are Israel, nor are all Abraham's children. On the contrary, it's through Isaac. Then in verse 8 he says that it's not the natural children who are God's children, but it's the children of the promise who are regarded as Abraham's offspring. And then in verse 9, he reiterates this promise by quoting Genesis 18, 14, and how at the appointed time the Lord would return and that Sarah would have a son, a biological son. In order to better understand why Paul says what he says, even the way he says it, we must 
first be privy to the backstory of what's really going on here. Paul has been sort of defending himself against the false accusations as a Jew, from the Jew, of being a traitor to the Jew. And it's by virtue of their thinking that there are no longer any advantages for the Jew. Because he's just got done telling them that salvation is available for the Gentiles the same way that it is for the Jew. So naturally their conclusion will be, well, what's the point of being a Jew? What's the use? What's the good? What's the advantage? What are the benefits of being a Jew, God's chosen people, through the promise, through Isaac? And so Paul's going to address that. He comes off a little bit defensive, but there's a good reason for it. It's in a sanctified way. He says, God's word did not fail. Why would he say that? Because they thought God's word must have failed, if not all who have the privileges as and of the people of God really belong to the people of God. So certainly God's word must have failed. If not all who are Israel are from Israel, are truly Israel. So Paul's going to now address this, and he's going to sort of you know, take and unload this so that it's easier to get our minds around. Maybe better said, just because one descended from Israel doesn't necessarily mean that they are Israel. Not all Abraham's children are Jews. Uh, early on in my Christian walk, I wasn't sure who I was. And I'm not talking about I need to find myself. You know, I was <laughs> poor self-esteem. You need to love yourself, pastor. No, it wasn't that. Basically what it was was I wasn't sure who I was. I, I grew up in a home being told that I was a Palestinian. And then later on I kind of realized, well, there are no more Palestinians. Uh, that's a transliteration of the Philistines. And there are no more Philistines. And this whole Palestinian cause, this whole Palestinian state, is a manufactured lie from the father of lies, Satan himself. No such thing as a Palestinian. So... Now, I, now I'm really lost. Well, who am I? Well, you're, you know, in Christ, it doesn't matter if you're a Palestinian or an Egyptian or a Jew or a whatever, Hawaiian or, you know, Chinese or Japanese, and you can fill in the rest of the blanks. We're all one in Christ. It doesn't matter what you are. But then it was interesting because in my study of God's Word, I began to realize that my father was likely, as an Egyptian, a descendant from Ishmael. And my mother, who thought she was a Palestinian, was probably more like an Edomite. Edom, a.k.a. Esau, which we'll talk more about him soon. So I began to realize, you know what? These are all of these ites, the Edomites, the Moabites, the Jebusites, the flashlights, the termites, the parasites, all the ites. They're all a big melting pot of Arab people. Now, why do I bring that into the occasion? Because into the discussion, because the Arabs today will lay claims to Abraham. And they do it because by doing that, they can come under the banner of the promise. And thus, the land, the promised land, if they can lay claims to Abraham. Well, here, Paul is going to blow holes in it. He says, on the contrary, though Abraham had two offspring, Ishmael and Isaac, it would only be recognized through Isaac that the promise would come. This is the acid test as to whether or not one was a true Jew or not. Was there birth from the flesh, Ishmael, or from the spirit, Isaac? Well, what do you mean? Well, Ishmael, if you remember, was the son that was born to Hagar, who was Hagar. She was the maidservant of Abraham and Sarah. 
And in their efforts, in the energy, in the strength of their own flesh, they tried to help God out to keep His promise. We better get this show on the road, honey. I'm 90. You're 100 years old. That ship has sailed. God still hasn't given us a promised son. Let's get this show on the road. I want you to meet Hagar. We took her out of Egypt. You might remember. Uh, Hagar, Abraham. Abraham, Hagar. Okay. Fast forward and you have Ishmael. It is a type of the flesh. It was done in the natural. And then God says, no. I have a promise that will be done in the supernatural. And it will come vis-a-vis Isaac. Now this is why Paul ever so beautifully and brilliantly illustrates it by bringing Abraham into the narrative. You might say he's got their Jewish attention. You you bring Abraham into any discussion in the Middle East, you've got people's attention. Father Abraham. Now, they knew that as a Jew, they were the descendants of Isaac and not Ishmael. And so too did they know that Isaac was the promised offspring. But the problem is that they fancied themselves as being entitled to this promise promise, simply because they were the natural born descendants of Isaac. That entitled them to all of the benefits of being God's chosen people. And Paul is now going to dismantle that. And to say what Paul writes here would have been explosive and even scandalous to this Jewish thought would be a gross understatement to say the least. He is shaking the very foundation upon which they have built their basis for salvation. Just as they needed to be descendants of Isaac, the second birth, by the way, of a son to Abraham, so too did they need the second birth from Jesus, the firstborn son of God. Huh? Listen, (laughs) I really need for you to stay with me, please. Put on your thinking cap, as one teacher always used to tell me, and me only in class. (laughs) Don't let the enemy rob you of this by planting that doubt in your mind that you can't understand this. God has given you an intellect. You can understand this. And the ramifications of this are so far-reaching, it reaches into all of eternity. This is the second birth. Here's how I get there. Isaac isn't merely an illustration theoretically. He also provides us a powerful application practically. We saw this in our study in the book of Joshua, which, by the way, we're in the book of Joshua on Thursday nights right here uh, for our midweek Bible study, our midweek service, uh, 7 o'clock right here. Did I say it's 7 o'clock Thursday nights? So Thursday nights right here, 7 o'clock, book of Joshua, right here, 7 o'clock Thursday nights. (laughs) Listen, I, I know I'm being silly, but here's the thing. The Old Testament conceals what the New Testament reveals. When I first came to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, I read the whole Bible from Genesis to Revelation the first time. It took me about six months. And uh, I started in the Old Testament. Uh, In retrospect, I wouldn't recommend that because I started in Genesis, and I mean, the, the whole way through, I'm just going, huh? What? And I was a blank slate. I'm like... Do do I have to, like, get an animal and sacrifice it for my sins and shed its blood? I'm thinking, do they do that? I don't see livestock in church parking lots. What is up with this? I was a blank slate. And then when I got to the New Testament, I'm going, of course! Of course it all makes sense now. What I'm saying is, when you understand the Old Testament, it brings to life the New Testament. And the book of Joshua is certainly no exception. See, in Joshua chapter 15, it painted a picture of Caleb as a type of the Holy Spirit. Now, by the way, what I mean by type is it's a picture of 
a, a type of the Holy Spirit, just like Joshua was a type of Yahshua. In fact, the name is the same. They don't pronounce the J in the Hebrew tongue, but Yahshua is Joshua. And Joshua is a picture in typology of the person of Jesus Christ. And Caleb is a type of the Holy Spirit. Remember, Caleb and Joshua were the only two of the 12 spies that were granted access and entrance into the promised land. But then you get to chapter 16, and it gets even more fascinating because it paints a picture of Manasseh and Ephraim as a type of the second birth. Who were Manasseh? And Ephraim, they were the two sons of Joseph. But Ephraim was greater as the second born. You understand, this, this is in the culture even today, to be the firstborn son is everything. You're entitled to the inheritance as the firstborn son. See, I was the firstborn son. In fact, my name, the nature in Arabic, Wahid, that's my given name, by the way, which now you can see why I go by JD, a little easier to pronounce, you know, spit on people when you say your name. Wahid, you clear your throat every single time. But it means one, first, firstborn. In the Arabic New Testament, speaking of Jesus, it says, El Wahid, the firstborn. I think that's really cool. But um, anyway. <laughs> so in the, in the Middle Eastern culture, the firstborn is everything. In fact, the father takes the name of the firstborn son, not the secondborn son. I have two sons. And in my culture, they would address me and honor me by saying to me, Abu Elias, the father of Elias, my firstborn son, not Levi, my secondborn son. That would be inappropriate. It would be an insult. Well, what's the point? Well, the point is, is that to bless the secondborn son, in this case Ephraim, over the firstborn son, so much so that dad, Joseph, thought it was a mistake, takes his dad's arms and, you know, because you know, I know you're hard of seeing, but you're going to bless Ephraim as the firstborn, and he's not the firstborn, and it's Manasseh. And he says, no. It's the second born son that will be the greater, that will receive the blessing. Ephraim, as the second born son, is a picture of the second birth. When we, as believers, are born again of the Spirit of God. And that is the greater. And we see this dynamic throughout Scripture with the likes of Cain as the firstborn and Abel as the second born. It would be Abel who was blessed, Cain who was cursed. Fast forward the biblical clock to our text here this morning dealing with Ishmael as Abraham's firstborn son by Hagar, the flesh, and Isaac, Abraham's secondborn son to Sarah, the spirit. Then, it doesn't stop there, you have Aaron the firstborn son of Amram and Yahbed, but it would be the secondborn son. You know who he was? You know his name. You know him very well. Moses. Aaron was the firstborn son, but it would be Moses who would be the deliverer. It would be Moses who was the one that was blessed. Why the second birth? Why the second born? Well, along with Cain and Abel, Manasseh and Ephraim, Ishmael and Isaac, and Moses and Aaron, you have Esau and Jacob. And by the way, Paul's going to bring that into the discussion in the verses that follow. With Ishmael and Isaac, it's the second birth, but with Jacob and Esau, it's not only the second birth, it's the rejection of that birth. That's going to be huge. And Lord willing, we'll be studying this next week, commencing with verse 10. And <laughs> we're in, I got to warn you, we're in for a, a, a real difficult passage because we're going to take and tackle this uh, statement that God hated Esau. That, that's very disturbing to a lot of people. And we're going to uh, unpack that and hopefully uh, understand that. But I need to keep moving here lest we uh, be here till uh, 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Second service will just join us. There's no room, but oh well. Be that as it may, we still have this unanswered question on the table for which we need to 
now provide a correct biblical answer. The question, how can I know whether or not I'm a true Christian? The answer, you are only a true Christian if you're born again, the second birth of the Spirit. Well, I was born into a Christian home. Okay, that's nice, by the way, especially for those of us who had anything but that growing up. But being born into a Christian home doesn't make you a Christian. Just like being born in a garage doesn't make you a car. I'll give you some time on that. I know it's deeply profound. Our first birth of the flesh is like Ishmael naturally. The flesh, flesh and blood, naturally. But we need that second birth when we're born again of the Spirit like Isaac supernaturally. Now, this brings up an even bigger question, uh, one for which I'm asked on many occasions. How do you know? How do you know whether or not someone is really born again or not? I mean, they say they're a Christian. I mean, are they born again? John 3, unless a man is born again, Jesus said, he will not see the kingdom of God. Well, how do I know if I'm born again? Do I have to go back into my mother's womb to be born again? No, that's the physical, the natural. This is a spiritual birth, a supernatural birth. Well, how do I know whether or not I'm born again, or how do I know whether or not someone is born again? Well, at the risk of an oversimplification, I'm going to borrow heavily from my wife's and my experience when our children were born. I'll have you know, I was at every single one of the births, and it was very hard on me. (laughs) Okay, some of the wives are going, oh, really? Is your wife here? No. If she was, I'd have never said that. (laughs) I was at the birth of all four of our children, and the reality of our newborn was brought home when we brought them home. Let's just say that there was no doubt this child was a new birth. And it was evidenced by how often our little bundle of joy craved mommy's milk. If baby didn't get milk, we didn't get sleep. And just when you, you know, think that you're going to actually start getting a good night's sleep, they start teething. So the, the teething is just in time for the weaning, which is just in time for the eating of the bread and meat to chew with those new teeth. And they begin to grow. And our little bundle of joy isn't so little anymore. Because as they grow, they begin to crawl and no longer are they toddlers. So we have to child lock our entire home. And some of those locks are so effective, we couldn't even get in them. <laughs> Remember that? Some of you go, man, how can I forget? Then they continue to eat, sleep, and cry. Not necessarily in that order. And they begin to walk, then run, then fall, then get enormous lumps on their head. I mean, I remember one time I actually watched this lump grow from a golf ball to a softball. Couldn't believe it. I'm thinking, oh no. And I'm thinking to myself, how are you okay? Because I'm not okay with this. I'm looking at this huge softball on your head because you're learning to walk. It's at this point that every parent longs for their child to grow up fast, only to wish, once they do, that they didn't have to grow up so fast. Well, here's my point. And yes, I do have a point. Just as a newborn craves milk, so too do we, as newborns in Christ, crave the milk of the Word of God. 
See, I will know for a certainty that I or someone I know is born again by how much they crave the Word of God, the things of God, even fellowship with the people of God. That's how I'll know. When I was born again, I could not put God's Word down. It was life. It was the bread of life. The Word of life. It was my sustenance. And I was able to grow. Interesting. I did a study of this uh, years back when our firstborn son was born on the uh, hormones and antibodies in mother's milk. Do you know that with formula, they cannot replicate over 400 hormones that are only in mother's milk? Had a dear friend of mine, high school classmate, uh, his wife and he uh, lost a son about two years of age. And uh, the doctor said to her, the longer you nurse him, the longer he'll live. And so she nursed him until his dying day. All that to say, the same thing is true with the Word of God. It's that which keeps us alive. It's that which sustains the life. And we're not to stay there. The writer of Hebrews tells us, you know, in fact, he rebukes them. So by now, you should be eating meat, you should be teaching, but you're still on milk. You, you've never matured. You've never teethed. You've never grown. Well, how are you going to grow? You grow from milk to meat to what I like to call manna. What's the difference? Well, sometimes there's just the milk for the newborn, for the new believer. Nothing wrong with that. In fact, everything right with that. Then there's the meat. Once you start to grow and mature, and listen, I, you know, who of us doesn't like a barbecued steak, man? You sink your teeth. Now some of the vegetarians are going, ew. It's okay. <laughs> Pray for us meat eaters. But then there's the manna. That's the Word of God that is given at precisely the right time at the right moment, and it speaks perfectly to your situation. It's the Word of God via the Holy Spirit of God ministering to you and me as the people of God. That's the manna from God. And it's new every morning. That's how you know you're born again. Furthermore, I'll know whether or not one is born again by how they grow and go from crawling to walking to stumbling to falling in their walk. I mean, this is just part and parcel to the life as a new believer in Jesus Christ. I want to round a quick corner in closing. Yeah, right. Okay, my first closing. And... <laughs> share with you by the way you're all very gracious to me you have treasures in heaven because of it but I want to share with you something else that's not so easily visible in the text related to both Ishmael and Isaac as we grow and mature in our Christian walk we'll begin to walk in the spirit Isaac, and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh, Ishmael. I always, as a new believer, could not, you know, quite understand. I always had a hard time understanding what it meant to walk in the Spirit. I'll never forget, it was many, many years ago, and I was uh, in business at the time, and I had uh, someone that I was doing business with. He happened to be a gypsy, 
And I remember I was sharing Jesus Christ with him, and uh, we were uh, together once at lunch with another uh, Christian brother. So it was he as a gypsy non-believer, and then myself and this other brother as believers, and we're talking back and forth, and we're using our Christian jargon. And he says to me, hey, uh, J.D., how's your walk? And it's like, you know, things are going well. I'm in a good place right now. And I started going, well, then afterwards, the gypsy comes to me and says, what do you mean your walk? He, he said, he said I, st- I started thinking to myself, you know, my, my walk is fine. Just, you know, I'm, how's your walk? Are you limping or, you know? And that it dawned on me that we got to be oh so careful around non-believers. We should never assume that they understand, hey, how's your fellowship? Fellowship? Your walk? I mean, that, it jams their gears. Well, anyway, I tried to explain to him the best of my ability at the time, what it meant. And I was so blessed after we moved here to Hawaii from the mainland, I got a call from him and he said, uh, I'm born again. I just almost started weeping. I, I couldn't believe it. You know, God's word doesn't return void. If, if you're here this morning, you got somebody you've been praying for, a family, a friend, a coworker, a, an associate, you've been praying for this, and never stop, never give up. You never know. <laughs> You're going to get that call one day and they're going to say, you know, I gave my life to Christ and it's going to be so worth it. And it's fruit added to your account. Well, back to our Ishmael and Isaac in my first closing, which I'll try to work into my second closing here. See, we may stumble and fall as born again Christians, but like with the child who learns to walk, then run, so too do we walk, then run the race. Well, pastor, you still haven't told me what you mean by what it means to walk in the Spirit and not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Well, we as born-again Christians can birth an Ishmael when we operate in the flesh as opposed to walking in the Spirit. And here's how. If I'm not in step with the Spirit and feeding the Spirit, milk, meat, manna, and not depriving the flesh, then by default, I will find myself becoming a carnal Christian. What does a carnal Christian mean? Carnal means flesh, Ishmael. Next time you go out and buy a can of uh, you know, chili, or yeah, chili, chili con carne. It's chili with, with flesh. You're eating flesh, meat. That's what it means. <laughs> okay, anyway, so I just thought I'd let you know that. That's what it means, carn, flesh, meat. <laughs> Did you know that? I don't think you knew that, right? Okay, I see you learn something new every day. Okay, back to the second closing. <laughs> On the other side of that table, if I'm busy in the spirit, I won't have time for the flesh. And that's what it means to walk in the spirit. I'm in sync. I'm in step. I'm busy about the things of the spirit, and I have no time for the lusts of the flesh. That's how it works. And I'm busy feeding the spirit. I love the illustration of a sheep, a lamb, and a lion. The lion, the flesh. (laughs) I know the effects. uh, I'm telling you, I shouldn't go on a two-week staycation. This is what happens. (laughs) The lion, the flesh. The lamb, the spirit. Well, in the natural, that lion going to eat that lamb for lunch and still be hungry. There's no contest. But what if you starve that lion and instead you feed that, that lamb? That lion is going to be so weak it can't walk. Conversely, the lamb is going to be so strong. It's not only walking, it's running the race. Eyes on the prize. As my friend Gail Irwin says, it's not just lamb, it's Lambo. (laughs) How's that for a word picture, yeah? (laughs) 
Why don't you all stand? I need to... I need to learn to stop preaching when the sermon's over. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord, <laughs> Lord, first of all, thank you for humor. Thank you for laughter, which is what Isaac means, is laughter. It's just laughable, the things you do in the supernatural. Incomprehensible. Lord, I think I speak for everyone here in this wonderful church this morning when I pray this, but I, I would venture to say and pray that there's not one person here who doesn't want this, doesn't want the Spirit-filled, the Spirit-led life, that doesn't want to no longer fulfill the lusts of the flesh, who wants that assurance that they are heaven bound and rapture ready, born again of the Spirit. Lord, will you now take this to the next level by blessing it to our hearts as you minister the application of it by your Holy Spirit to our lives. And Lord, lastly, for anyone here this morning whom you've spoken to and ministered to, Will you now prompt them, propel them to take the next step and do something about it? For we ask this in Jesus' name.